Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so we're going to start a new topic today, which is interest rate risk. We're going to discuss them in, in very detail. So uh, that we have discussed already, like in a general basis from the previous lectures. Uh, today, we're going to start with the interest rate risk. Uh, so basically, is the interest rate risk accused and financial institutions they are exposed to interest rate risk when the changes happens in the movement of the interest rate because that changes in the interest rate that change the bank's net interest income on loans and securities and interest cost on deposits and the other banks borrowing so they are thought it affects differently that difference it's creating either loss or sometimes it provides a gain but the banks, uh, they prefer to have a more stable situation where the interest rates are not subject, are not subject, interest rate changes are not subject to change actually. So changing the interest rate also changes the, the market value of the bank's asset and liability. We saw it on a basic like uh, example, it was a bond value, how the bond value changes and the bond value is one of the main assets we can say. So uh, that's a change in, in interest rate. Uh, basically, it affects both sides. It affects the balance sheet and the statement of the income and expenses. This is what you should know in your. OK, uh, so let us go into more deeply analysis how these things are happening, how this interest rate changes, like how it happens that interest rate changes why it's not stable like uh, can it be just fixed by the government and just be 10 percent or 12 percent and be fixed why the interest rate changes what is the factors that drive the interest rate up and down so what are the main determinants of the interest rate movements actually so there is a theory that was generated uh, it's it is called as a loanable fund theory you might be known this like from your previous finance courses you might be facing this theory already so this loanable funds and theory of interest rate determination it used the level of the interest rate in the financial market as a result from the factor that affect supply and demand of loanable fund so basically we are here dealing with demand and supply these are the factors that explain the changes in interest rate so this uh, is very similar to the way that the price for goods and services in generally viewed as a result for, for the forces of supply and demand in the microeconomic courses. Like you already took the microeconomic courses and you have seen that uh, how the demand and supply determine the price, how they determine the quantity goods and services that are traded at certain price. Because there is nobody who can affect in a competitive market, all the suppliers and demand their price takers rather than just they do not charge any price. Only in the monopolistic way of doing it, they charge the price on it. Because example of the Kazakhstan, all the developing countries, all the developed financial countries, they're having a competitive based market. So which means that the the price of the interest is determined by demand and supply rather than the, by the government. So the government get, just gives the direction and some regulation that makes them to work. But how they affect, we'll see them as well. So first of all, let us talk about the monetary policy through which policy the interest rate is actually is affected and through which policy the interest rate is being changed. Uh, indirectly is the called the monetary policy it is the demand side of economic policy that refers to the action that is undertaken by the central bank in every in, in a specific country that controls the money supply to achieve a certain macroeconomic goals basically that promotes a sustainable economic growth So let us talk about the Fed monetary policy. And Fed is the Federal Reserve System in the US. It's a central bank uh, for the US. In Kazakhstan, it's a central bank. And for each country, there is a central bank. And all these central banks has got monetary policy uh, tools. 
And these are the tools are called open market operation. This is the first tool. The second one is uh, discount grade. And the third one is required reserve ratio. And these are the tools to use to control the money supply. Okay. They are used to control the money supply. And money supply, it is basically is showing the quantity of the money that circulates in the economy. So these are the tools that are used to control the money supply, either to increase or decrease the money supply. But why they are doing so? Uh, with certain reasons. To stabilize the economy, to have a sustainable economic growth. Okay. If, let's say, they want, if there is a recession in the country, if there is a recession in the country, okay, everybody knows what is the recession. Who can tell me the definition of the recession? So what is the recession? Who can tell me what is the recession? And the economy is doing bad. Economy is what? Doing bad. When the economy is doing bad, can you give me more uh, clear picture of the when the economy is doing bad? What do you mean by economy is doing bad? Well, unemployment. Unemployment rate rises. So first, uh, when there's a recession, period. unemployment goes up. But why the unemployment goes up? Contraction of economy, meaning but, that the growth rate uh, decreases or even slows down. So there's a contraction of economy happens. That uh, contraction of economy, it means that GDP that is the main factor, that is main proxy that shows how economy is growing, is going down, okay? This is what we know about it. The contraction of the economy. Unemployment increases because of the GDP construction. So as the contraction happens, this, let me put in a, uh, in a chain because it is very important what takes first, okay? Let me put it just in a chain because it's very important. So first, if there is a recession, that uh, brings a contractionary, contraction of economy or GDP goes down. GDP goes down. That when the GDP goes down, that reduces unemployment Reduction that causes unemployment reduction. Okay, this is what we face actually basically in all countries if there is a recession that recession means that their GDP is going down uh, Every 13 every three quarters the unemployment reduced uh, That will create a big problem and Actually before unemployment why the GDP grow? Why the recession take the place? Uh, there is a demand issue Demand for goods and services falls. That uh, actually makes the consequences to take the place as the GDP goes down. So as the demand for goods and services falls, that takes the uh, goods contraction of the economy, the GDP falls down. As the GDP goes down, uh, that means that if we do not produce as a company, as a factory, if we don't produce anything, why we should keep extra employees as a variable cost? So we need to just reduce. We need to fire some workers. That will uh, that will increase action, not reduce. Sorry, I wrote uh, reduction, but I, I was talking about employment. But unemployment will go up certainly due to this reason because the people will be fired. So this is the case that we face basically around the globe, okay? And in here we need to have, uh, you, as you call, let me make certain goods and services, okay? So this is the structure, how it works the economy. So for the government to solve it, uh, they need to kind of motivate, they need to solve it. And the motivation is, they think is demand, okay? And they believe this is demand. 
So they need to motivate the demand to buy in goods and services. If they don't buy it, the economy will not be recovered. But how they can motivate? By giving them money. So motivating the people, the household to buy, they give them money. They give the, uh, the uh, motivation to buy something. So to do that, they increase the money supply, okay? So they increase the money supply, increase the money supply. That will increase the demand for goods and services, demand for goods and services. Eventually GDP will go up and that will reduce unemployment. Unemployment reduce, okay? This is how they increase the money supply, okay? And they will take it until, until it reach equilibrium, okay? It's very important. Just one question. Yes, please. Uh, can the Fed also regulate the money supply by uh, buying and issuing the, the bonds? Yeah, yeah, I'm coming, yes, I'm coming to that point. That's a good question. Uh, I'm coming to that point. So once you know how to uh, uh, increase the demand for the goods and services that eventually will increase the GDP and unemployment will be reduced due to this and uh, economy will, re uh, until it reaches equilibrium where the economy will be at its full equilibrium where there is zero in unemployment and GDP is at high, at its maximum growth. That is the main point, like increasing the money supply. But it cannot be, you know, increasing the money supply is very uh, dangerous. If you increase by a huge amount that is required, more than it's required, you may create a inflation or hyperinflation. So you should increase it in a way it will keep stable the inflation and it will keep, uh, what do you call it? The GDP growth in a stable money, increasing money. So increasing money. So if you have inflation, inflation in the country, high inflation or hyperinflation, this is another problem, okay? At this point, demand for goods and services will fall as well. That will reduce the GDP. That will reduce the GDP. And GDP reduction, that will, of course, create unemployment increase. So what could be done to improve the situation? So the opposite should be done. So this is the first scenario, okay? This is the first scenario. In the second scenario, we have inflation, okay? So what could be done is to, uh, you should reduce the money supply. You should reduce the money supply. Money supply should be decreasing, okay? Money supply decrease. And D for goods and services will be motivated, go up. go up. So this is the main point, okay, for the monetary policy to use, actually. If there is a recession, then money supply increases. If there is inflation, the money supply should be going down. When there's inflation, there's, it means like expansionary economy, okay? It's not good as well. Expansionary. Expansionary. So, and this is the case recession of is contractionary, okay, economy. So in the case of expansion, the money supply should be reduced. So there should be something very stable. There should be something very controllable and it cannot be something like more money, more motivated people. No, it doesn't work like this. So there are three tools that are used to control the money supply. E money supply either to increase or decrease and we know when we when we need to decrease the money supply and we know we, when we need to reduce the money supply however 
increasing, decreasing the quantity of the money, it affects the interest rate. You see how much effect it has. It, 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 so it has the effect not only the good services market, it has an effect on the financial market as well. Okay, the money supply. That's why the government should take into consideration while they're increasing the money supply, they should take into consideration the effect on the financial markets. So these are the three tools that are used, actually. And let's see, open market operation, discount rate and re uh, reserve requirement. Open market operation is buying and selling the government treasury securities like bonds, treasury bills with a purpose. So when you buy the bonds, from the market so as a government i go and buy from the market uh, bonds or treasury bills that means i'm pumping up the market with money i'm increasing the quantity of the money in the market if i buy because i get the bonds from the market but i in return i give the money to the market this is what i call as buying the bonds increasing the money supply so in order to increase the money supply the government should buy the bonds okay so buying bonds through the open market operation if the government sells the bonds or treasury bills or any governmental securities that means the government puts their securities into the market and taking out the money from the market this is the main reason okay uh, by government i mean in here the federal reserve system or central bank okay this is how they works it, that makes the people to work. Okay, but how the interest rate is affected, we'll see. There's another way, discount rate, discount rate. And when the government by force, so the most preferable way of uh, affecting the money monitor, uh, the market is using the first tool, but second tool is not that much preferred as the first one, but still there, there are the ways that they use the discount rate they directly by manually they're trying to put the rate so they say this is the rate and this everybody should try to go with this rate so that's it everybody should be paying attention to this rate nobody can make something so if the rate was five percent and the government said the rate will be three percent so those banks that they used to borrow they used to lend they should be adhered to the position that the fed tells them to be actually so it's not preferable, but they still make it. Reserve, uh, so that affects the money supply. If discount rate is very low, that means that the people uh, will borrow more money. There will be a huge demand. There will be there will people rush and demand for money because now the cost of borrowing is down. And by people, I mean the household and the investors, those who want to invest in a fixed capital. But we have on the other side, other investors who are investing in the uh, financial market. So they will be demotivated, like the opposite. They will not be have, feel that, oh, the rate is reduced. Why should I go and invest in here? So you remember the global financial crisis, the T-bills was offering 1% of rate and the CDO was, they were offering like 5% of return. So the, the investors, they decided to move from T bills to the CDO, this collateralized debt obligation that was like triggered the global financial crisis itself. Actually, this is another thing. And the third is reserve requirements. Uh, the amount of the deposit the banks must hold in the bank. As the required reserve ratio increases, the amount of the money which is available for the loan is reduced. So. Uh, reduction in the reserve requirement that increase the amount of the money. So if 20% is required reserve ratio, that means that uh, available of the money will be 80% as it increases from 20 to 30%. The availability of the money in the market will be less. So this is the thing that we're using, but most of the country, they use monetary tools. Uh, out of three, they use and they apply this open market operation. So this is the example of loanable fund theory. Okay, here's the supply, here's the demand, and this is the point of equilibrium. This is what you know 
from economic course where the uh, on the y-axis we have a price but it is interest so each money is priced with interest and the quantity of money basically supply is referring to the supply of money like those who supply money who supplies the money the banks the financial institutions and demand for money demand for loanable funds is those people household investor who are uh, they are the borrowers okay so these are the creditors these are the borrowers let me just have it so supplies are lenders and demand are borrowers okay so these people borrow and and this is the point where the equilibrium takes the place this is the point where the lenders and the borrowers are satisfied and they say this is good point this is very good point that they say it's the best point that could be ever achieved actually by anyone so uh, if interest rate if interest rate happens to be let me just draw it at this point okay if interest rate happens to be at this point that creates a surplus at this point at higher rate of interest the lenders they say we will be willing to lend very huge amount of the money because the more we lend at higher rate the more money we earn actually and we know that the financial institution they earn the only the way they use they are earning the money is through the interest rate and higher the interest rate the more money they will generate and they will be more happy however for the borrowers it's gonna be very costly they will say look it's really huge interest rate and the interest rate is, is the cost of borrowing because all the corporation all the companies and factories when they produce something when they used to produce when they pay the salary they, they do it through the financing of creditors through the finance of the financial institution so they borrow it if the interest rate increases they will be less willing to to borrow and we know that uh, investors or the companies and the fact uh, they have two choice either to go through the liability or to go through the equity to finance their certain projects okay if they say cost of borrowing increases they will go from the liability side to that project to finance it if liability falls i mean the cost of liability falls the cost of borrowing they will go from the liability side but in here as it increases you can see there's a uh, surplus of money lent very good question does it work you mean uh Bergen, does it work in a real market this was the question that you were asking does this theory work in the real market we will see there are some studies there are some research research was conducted by scholars they come up with the certain emerging and developed markets too of course it's different actually it's in emerging market and a developing market it works differently but we're gonna discuss it okay in theory it is like seeming is very good actually and it's it can be controlled however uh, we'll see that some of them is approving uh, empirically there was some conducted research and they come up with a certain conclusion I will come to that point and so surplus of this is created however if the interest rate falls to here below the equilibrium market it creates a surplus of demand then this so there's a shortage of loanable funds below the equilibrium interest rate the lenders they are less willing to supply the lenders they are willing to less supply there the question comes let me see so when it falls below the equilibrium there is a shortage of loanable funds however there is a very huge demand because they say the cost of borrowing reduced now we are we'll, now we'll be very happy to borrow money because that will reduce our cost of producing goods and services so let's borrow more however the interest rate is not available so this point and this point push 
the interest rate to the equilibrium point where the lenders and the borrowers are satisfied at I star and the Q star. So, uh, you have questions? Okay, imagine there is an increase in the loanable fund. Let's say the monetary policy was taken to increase the monetary policy. There is a recession in the country, okay? We have recession in the country. So we have got recession. And in order to solve the problem with the recession, the Fed or central bank in Kazakhstan, they decide to increase the money supply, the quantity of the loanable funds. And they say we will do it through the open market operation. Who can tell me how the open market operation works when they want to increase the money supply? Tell me, please, what they should do. Buy or sell the bonds? Mostly buying the government buy. bonds by central banks. So buy bonds. Central bank, they should buy the bonds in order to increase the money supply. So let's say the central bank, they decided to buy the bonds to reduce the recession, uh, the pressure on the economy by recession. That will eventually they want to motivate the demand for goods and services, okay? For goods and services, not the demand for money. Demand for money is totally different, guys. We want increase the money supply, the quantity of the money in the economy in order to motivate demand for goods and services, in order to reduce the recession. So in this way, once we buy the bonds as a central bank, the loanable, the quantity of the loanable fund will increase. That will increase the supply curve from SS to SS asterisk, okay? So it will increase, let's say S1 and S2, okay? It will increase from supply one to supply two of the loanable fund. So as you can see, as the more supplies of the loanable funds are available, in the economy that will reduce the interest rate and we know the fact that when the interest rate is reduced that reduces the cost of borrowing as the cost of borrowing reduce more investors will be happy and will be pleased or will be willing to get the loans from the banks and the financial institutions that will motivate them to buy more goods and services they will have more money because the cost of borrowing, let's say, give me the example, there's a Halik Bank and Caspi. So basically the market uh, lending rate is 12%. No, no, sorry, 20%. The market lending rate 20%. Plus, uh, I'm talking about the loan, like you can take up to 6 million uh, tenge without any collateral based on your salary. So 20% will be annual, annual interest rate plus uh, there is a 10% is commission when you get the loan. The, this is 10% is good, uh, you are paying once. So Halik and Caspi. Guys, I'm just giving the example of the banks is not the matter of the advertising them, but for a purpose to understand better, okay? So Halik tells you, this is the market interest rate for both, but Recently, uh, during the before just uh, pandemic took the place, before the coronavirus took the place, the Halik said, I will give you a loan at 15% and my commission, uh, the insurance and so on will be 5%. So they reduced the, this 20% to 15 and they reduced this 10% to 5. So in basically you're going to pay 20% in total instead of paying 30. So they reduced the interest rate kind of attracting people, come and buy, come and get the loan, okay? So this, what, why I'm giving you this example? Because I want to show you the people they run for that type of loan. 
when the interest rate falls, they say, okay, let's get the loan and buy the car I didn't buy. Now I'm able to buy the interest rate fall. It motivates me good. Even though if, I'm almost, if I was a household and I was on the edge to think to borrow or not, because it was 30%, now the Halik Bank reduced and it gave me a good chance. Okay, let me go and get it. Let me go and get it. I just go and went, I got the loan, I bought the car for myself. And that increased the uh, demand for goods and services. So this is how the money supply reduced the interest rate and it increased the demand. So the main point of the monetary tools or central bank is to increase the demand for goods and services. Don't confuse the demand with, for money and the demand for the goods and services. They are totally different. Demand for money, it means borrowers who wants to borrow money and demand for goods and services are those who would like to buy the goods the final goods so interest rate reduced quantity of money increase as and the interest rate go down the consequences and that makes the people to buy more okay this is how the works the loanable fund this is the everything in theory guys this is how the theory works but where it's applicable in real market Honestly speaking, if you ask me as a researcher, I'm doing a lot of research, and this is not works actually really that much. But still in some cases it works, but that, not that much. Imagine the situation. Uh, in reality, if the people is already in debt, we know that 80% of the population in each country, the people are already in debt. I don't think so that in the reducing the interest rate, will make the people to go and borrow more. Okay, the question. Uh, you're interested in Central Asia economics. Uh, look, in Central Asia economics, let me give you an example of, uh, look, Japan uh, is as well as a Central Asian economy. It has a negative interest rate. Imagine what is the negative interest rate, let's say uh, minus, let me just see what is the negative interest rate today, okay? Let me share with you. Negative interest rate countries. So look, uh, Switzerland, Switzerland has got the negative interest rate, 0.75%, uh, which means if you go to the market, they're below the zero. This is zero and they're here somewhere. So, I mean, they cannot reduce anymore. That's it, they reduce their maximum capacity. So even they went beyond the schedule and still they cannot motivate the people to buy the goods and services demand. So this is for Switzerland, how it works. For Denmark, same with a negative interest rate. Japan, it's minus 0.1%. This uh, minus means that banks in these countries are ready to give you the money. Come and borrow, we will pay for it, for it. You don't pay the interest for your loan, but we will pay for it. Imagine how much the situation is terrible now. People, they stop borrowing the people they don't want to borrow money so the demand for money is low in these countries which is negative interest rate and this is the main one of the main reason is the inflation in it because the inflation is very low in that country this can be the another additional information but concerning uh, if you talk about uh, cis countries like kazakhstan kyrgyzstan uzbekistan these countries having the higher inflation and in these countries, it may still work, this monetary tool. But in these developed, highly developed countries like uh, Japan, it's not working anymore. That's it. So no more monetary tools can be used. Even now the US, uh, the Trump has announced the negative interest rate policy. They say we should apply as well because we cannot motivate any more the people to buy goods and services. And apart from that, guys, uh, this pandemic crisis really complicated the situation of the economic condition. So the economic economy was not good at all,
But when the pandemic took the place, it really destroyed at all. Uh, actually, my research is based on free interest rate uh, economies. Like I'm doing research, I'm trying to compare the competitiveness and financial performance of conventional banks with the Islamic banks, with the free interest rate banks. Okay, this is my actually main research area now. This is what I'm working actually on. It's a very interesting topic and we can see that all things are going to that place. Okay, we can discuss, uh, Begjan, if you want, uh, we can arrange the meeting, we can discuss if you're interested to do any research, I can be pleased to help you to find out with a certain topic. I'm okay with that, no problem. I can arrange the time for that as well. Okay, let's go further. So this is the case actually. So what happens if demand for loanable funds increases? Just by a sudden, uh, people, uh, borrowers, we can just say, they decided to borrow more of the money. So that increased the quantity of the money. That increased the quantity of the money. And definitely, actually not the quantity of money, I'm sorry to correct myself, demand for quantity of money, okay? Demand for loanable fund increases. So by suddenly people, they decided to go and, and rigorously to borrow more money. And of course the cost of borrowing will increase because there is shortage because this was the equilibrium. If demand increases at this point, at this quantity, the supply is not ready to, so if this was the case, if it was the interest rate, the suppliers are not ready to supply the quantity of money that is demanded at this rate. They say, if you want, I will be, giving you the loans or we will be giving you the loans at this rate only because the quantity that you're asking we can give you only at this price at this interest rate okay this is how it affects so as the quantity uh, the quantity of money increases and that will increase the quantity of money and that will increase this uh, interest rate An example of monetary policy implementation. Let's see some examples. And the most widely recognized successful implementation of monetary policy, it was in the US. It occurred in 1982 during the anti-inflationary recession caused by a Federal Reserve System under guidance of Paul Ward Walker. And another example, the more recent one, example of expansionary monetary policy. When it's mean the expansionary, it means that increasing the money supply but in here it was the vice versa okay anti-inflationary recession as housing prices began to drop and economy slowed down that reduced the gdp so the federal reserve system uh, in 2007 global financial crisis uh, started to cut the interest rate okay so it is they were using discount rate policy rather than the monetary policy okay they started to cut the policy in the June and the down to 0% by the end of the 2008. Because at this period, it was very difficult for to motivate, to motivate the people to borrow the money. And it was very difficult for the financial institutions to, uh, to lend the money because at 0%, they were not willing to lend any money. It was kind of a dilemma. Really, it was a very tough time on one point, you are trying to motivate the people. On the other point, the financial institutions are not motivated to lend money at 0% because it's nothing. And as you can see from the loanable funds, they are less willing. So with this economy still weak and embarked on the purchases of government. So what they did uh, additionally, they bought uh, government security TBOs and uh, from 2009 until to, uh, August 2014. So 
from this period, due within this period, they bought in total 3.7 trillions of dollars. So that means they pumped up the economy with this amount of the money to support the reduction of the interest rate. And what about the empirical evidence of the Fed's influence? So there's some uh, evidence that it took place in real economy. So the periods of expansive monetary, so periods of uh, expansive monetary policy are associated with a strong uh, performance. That means uh, they show that expansionary monetary policy, increasing the money supply, uh, this supportive package, that affected the financial market, that, uh, that uh, made stronger the performance of the stock market. Where the uh, period of uh, restrictive monetary policy uh, coincide with a weak stock performance. So it's if they try to reduce the money supply, that reduce the stock performance. Okay, this stage they found it out that the financial market how it react to expansionary and contractionary policy of monetary. And when it comes to the small companies, small enterprises, they are more sensitive than the large companies to change in monetary conditions. So for the large companies changing in monetary policy did not affect much. It only affected the small companies, okay? We're talking about the investor side. And when we talk specifically about the financial market in terms of stocks, the cyclical stock have much higher sensitivity to changes in monetary condition than defensive stocks. So uh, cyclical stocks are the normal stocks and shares that are traded in the market like car manufacture, air industry, and all other factors. But when it comes to the defensive stock, it doesn't mean, uh, do not confuse with the defense stock. Okay, there is a called uh, another type of stocks which are called defense stock, okay? Defense stock. It's based more military, okay? But uh, this defensive stock are called kind of more stable stocks. No matter what happens to the performance of the company, still there will be a dividend paid and the stock price of the defensive stocks are not changing. Okay. Like food and alcohol industry, yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the goods and services doesn't affect uh, the demand for the goods and services for certain products are not affected by much. Like uh, for the pandemic issue, the cyclical stock really, they underperformed because everything was isolated and the stock was about to crash. However, the stocks for the food industry, it was not much affected because the demand for the food even increased. So US monetary policy has an important influence on the global markets as well, because nowadays uh, all the financial markets are globalized, they are interconnected, and one uh, scholars uh, compared the US and the world like one plane. And one plane, one plane has got two wings. On one wing, like in each wing, there's engines. So on one side of the wing, there's engine of the US. On the other side, it is Europe and the rest of the world, okay? So any changes that happens on the wing, on one wing of the US engine, that definitely affects the, the whole plane. So this is how the global world is kind of affected by US monetary policy. So any changes in monet US monetary policy kind of has got some effect globally as well. So the interest rate and the net worth. Okay, there's a question. Why not China on the other wing? Uh, the China now maybe maybe for the future coming five years it can be considered. But nowadays, every like if imagine I give you the example, 
if what is the main if the yuan uh, value changes does it affect your decision as a household not don't put yourself in the shoes of the investor it's not affecting you at all that much it might affect you but the effect will be okay but imagine if the dollar changes we are so much connected to dollar us dollar the wallet affects too much especially for developing countries Okay, the China can be the country who is really good in export nowadays. However, nowadays, the, like uh, the flagman of the world nowadays is US still. But in terms of influencing the global market, I mean, not, I'm not talking about the production. The production, the flagman is the China now. I'm sure about it. However, the globally, financially, who makes the influence globally is the US. So uh, financial institutions are exposed to the risk due to the maturity mismatches between the assets and liabilities. We already discussed it. And we talked about the, during the thrift, the financial thrift. Thrifts are the financial institutions with during the 1980s, they had some problem with recession and it's in the US based. And the US uh, kind of applied and pumped the, the markets with the financial support to come up with a recession. So this is an example we talked about them. I'm gonna skip it. Okay, we talked about it, how it affects, skip. So in particular, we concentrate on three models that measuring uh, the financial institutions exposure to the interest rate risks. The first one is repricing gap model or funding gap model. The second one is maturity model and duration model. So the first one we're gonna discuss in this chapter and the second and the third models we're gonna discuss in the coming chapter, which is chapter uh, nine. It is interest rate risk two. So we're gonna start with the repricing gap model. So repricing gap model, it concentrates on the impact of interest rate changes on the financial institution's net interest income, which is a difference between financial net interest income and expense. So because of its simplicity, most small financial institutions, they prefer to use this model to assess their interest rate risk exposure. However, there is a major weakness of this repricing gap model. And that weakness is that uh, in this model, they are using mostly book value instead of the market value assets of liabilities. This is the main important because uh, models that are used in the repricing gap are, should be based on market value instead of. <clears throat> book value, because the book value is always different from the market value. So there are some maturity buckets that are given by the central bank is uh, kind of obligation for each. Nowadays, the bank, they have to submit some certain buckets quarterly. Uh, the buckets of the financial securities in terms of the maturities, uh, rational liabilities. If you have uh, assets or repos like the purchase agreement like one day, you have to categorize them as one day. If it's more than one to like from one day to three months, you have to categorize in this packet. If it's uh, three months to six months, they should be categorized in this packet. So they created uh, some buckets in terms of maturity, okay? You have to categorize them in this maturity. So more than six months to 12 months, more than one year to five years, and more than over the five years. So you have, to, if you reprice your model, you have to reprice in this model. So for the investors, for them to be able to understand what kind of the risk of interest you may be exposed as financial institution. And the repricing gap approach, the bank reports the gaps in each maturity bucket by calculating rate sensitivity assets of each asset and rate sensitivity liability on its balance sheet. So rate sensitivity here, we refer that asset and liability is reprised at near current market interest rate within a certain time horizon, like within, within a certain time maturity bucket, which was given above mentioned, okay? So we are given the pricing gap example, like one day securities, let's say uh, on the asset we have $20, uh, 
and $30 on the liability side, and there's a gap difference is minus 10, okay? And cumulative gap is 10. If uh, you want to see one day to thir three months, from one day to three months, the gap is 10 million. And cumulative, if you want to see everything up to three months, is 20 million. Minus, because that means that rate sensitive liabilities are higher than rate sensitive assets, okay? This is what it refers to. So this minus in gap means that rate, so minus gap means rate sensitive assets is lower than rate sensitive liability. So if you want to have six months to 12 months, uh, you have positive gap where you may conclude that rate sensitive assets are higher than the rate sensitive liabilities. But cumulative gap, it tells you opposite, like everything up to 12 months, everything is up to 12 months and so on. And everything is up to five years. So you can just accumulate and you come up with zero. So uh, applying the repricing gap model, uh, we would like to see uh, what will be the effect in net interest income, okay, on the income statement side. In order to measure it is the gap times the change in interest rate, okay? Gap, change in interest rate. And we know how to find the gap is the rate sensitive asset minus rate sensitive liability. And rate sensitive asset is when you reprice a certain asset within a certain maturity bucket. And maturity bucket, we already said, is up to one day, from one to three months, from six, from three to six months, from six to 12 months, from one year to five years, and over five years. This is what we call rate sensitive and rate sensitive liability. And when you get the difference between the rate sensitive assets and rate sensitive liabilities, you come up with a gap. And when you multiply gap by the change in rate, this will show you the change in net interest income in the certain bucket of maturity. So a gap is dollar size of the gap between the rate sensitive asset and rate sensitive liability and the change in interest rate as in a general level, okay? Let's say we've got an example here. I'm gonna go with this example only and I will let you go guys. So uh, in the one day bucket, so if you remember the buckets here, one day bucket, the gap is equal to minus 10 million. Okay, the numbers are in 10 million. How do we get it? 20 minus 30, it's 10 million. Not cumulative one, but I'm interested only in one day back, okay? One day back it is 10 million. So if interest rate changes by 1%, I mean, more specifically, increases by 1%, change in net interest income will be 100,000 reduction. So that means the financial institution will incur loss in the next year, in year one, incur loss by $100,000, okay? Okay, guys, I will stop in here. Tomorrow I will continue. Do you have any questions? No, thank you. If you don't have any no, questions. No, no questions. If you don't have any questions, thank you so much for your attention. See you tomorrow. See you. Thank you. Thank Goodbye. You. Have a good day. Bye.